Hi, it's Jackie with Panama Relocation Tours. Thank you so much for joining me for our Saturday live stream. Today, I'll be talking about driving in Panama, and it's kind of divided into two areas. There's driving in Panama City, which is a whole different animal than driving in the rest of the country. Uh, but before I get started, uh, just for the benefit of those that are new to our channel, I want to give you a little bit of background about Panama Relocation Tours. Since 2010, we've offered all-inclusive, six days, seven night uh, relocation tours that take you all across the country uh, to show you the most popular places to live. You'll meet immigration attorneys, real estate agents, um, learn about insurance, pet relocation, finding a rental, buying a car, getting health insurance, all the things you need to know to have a smooth move to Panama. For those that or know that you want to live in just a certain place. We also offer private tours of just specific areas in Panama. And for those that prefer to not do a tour at all, we have what we call our online guide or the complete Panama relocation guide, which is basically a home study course. It has the same information that you get on a tour, but it's all online. You can see that on our website, PanamaRelocationTours.com. And at the top, click on online guide. If you're interested in the tours, click on the tours tab and you'll see both uh, private tours and our group tours as well. So we have a lot. We have quite a few people here. We have our regulars. I have uh, Chuck and Debbie are our moderators today. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Debbie and Chuck, for being here to be a moderator um, there's so many conversations that are going on over on the side and for me to pay attention to what I'm saying and also take care of any questions that come in on the side uh, chat window. It's a little bit hard for me to do. So I recruited Chuck and Debbie to help with that uh, process and also monitor the conversations. So first of all, to talk about driving in Panama, let me just say that in Panama City, I won't drive. Two times I've driven in Panama City, and it was um, not a pleasant experience. The traffic is crazy, regardless of what time that you're driving there, it's just crazy. So if I go to Panama City, I fly into Panama City, and then I just use an Uber to get around, um, it's just so much easier to have someone else do the driving in Panama City. So the things I'm going to be talking about today are not about driving in Panama City. Once you cross that bridge of the Americas and you get to the rest of the country, this is what I'm going to be talking about today. So, um, and I have that list of things that I sent you, uh, things that we'll be discussing. One of those is the speed limit in Panama. Um, now, keep in mind, Panama uses the metric system. So you're not going to see signs that will be miles per hour. It's all in kilometers. Most cars, the odometer reading is also in kilometers. And when you see a sign that says 100 or 80 or 60, that's kilometers, not miles per hour. So when you're driving along and you see 100, know that that's kilometers. 100 is the maximum speed um, that you can go in Panama, which is about 62 miles per hour. So it's pretty slow compared to driving when I go to Austin, Texas and drive, I feel like everybody's whizzing right past me when I'm going 60 and they're probably going 80 or 90. It's a little bit scary. Same thing when I go to Mexico, they drive much faster in Mexico than they do here in Panama. So the maximum speed is 100 kilometers. However, the main road that goes from east, west in the country is called the Pan American Highway. And along the Pan American Highway, there's a lot of little towns uh, that you'll see. So as you're coming into town, you'll see a sign that says reduce your velocity. It doesn't tell you what to reduce it to. It's just telling you to slow down because you're coming into town. Then maybe a half a mile or a mile later, you'll see a sign that might say 80 kilometers or 60 kilometers. Now it's that time between when it says reduce your velocity and when it shows the next sign, there might be some cops that are hiding in the bushes um, waiting for you to be speeding or right after it goes from 80 kilometers to 60 or 40 or whatever it is, that's where you're often going to see some police that are hiding in the bushes um, that you don't even notice them until it's too late. And if you do, um, if you are speeding, um, they're very strict about speeding here. I was looking on, there's a Facebook page called Trafico Panama, and it said just yesterday there were 2,000 
136 speeding tickets were issued um, in our little country of Panama. So they're very serious about speeding. Now, if you do go speeding, the police officer is not usually going to get on their motorcycle or in their car and go chasing after you. Instead, just as you're driving by, just as you see the police officer, when it's too late for you to slow down, they're going to say, pull over, just pull over. And you're supposed to pull over. So one of three things are going to happen whenever you pull over. Um, the police officer, who probably does not speak English, the police officer is going to just uh, ask for your ID and they're going to start writing you a ticket. Um, and a speeding ticket is about $150 US, so it's quite expensive for speeding tickets. Depending on how fast you're going, it could be even more than that. Um, so you might just get a ticket. And there is a way to pay your ticket online. We have information about that in our online guide. The other thing that might happen, and you'll notice um, someone made a comment, this happened to them just yesterday, as they were in an area where it was 80 kilometers, but they were going 90. Police officer says, pull over. And the police officer said, well, you can either get a ticket or you can just pay $20 right now. So basically that's called a bribe. You're bribing the cop, you know, give them $20 now so you don't get that $150 ticket. Now, of course, it's against the law for the police officer to ask you for that $20 and for you to give him the $20 and participate in the bribe. But it's up to you. You can decide, you know, do I want to go ahead and pay the $20 and not have to deal with a ticket? Or do I want to tell him, just give me the ticket? You know, I don't have $20 to give to you right now. The other thing is if you give them, let's say that it's $20, $20 and all you have is a $100 bill in your wallet, they're going to say they don't have any change. No cambio means no change. Um, so it's a good idea to keep you know, some ones and fives and tens, maybe not in your wallet, but just in the glove box or somewhere in your car in case you do decide you want to participate in the bribing situation. So I've had both things happen to me. Um, shortly after I moved to Panama, my husband and I were going to go to Price Mart, and it was Good Friday. Um, I wasn't even thinking that something would be closed on Good Friday, but Panama is a very religious country, and um, a lot of things were closed on Good Friday. So we pulled into the parking lot of Price Mart, which is like a Costco, and realized that there was no other cars there that they were closed. So we got out of the parking lot and got back on the Pan American Highway. A few minutes later, police officer says, pull over. And it was one of those situations where he asked for my ID and he just started writing the ticket. And I'm trying to tell him, and I have my Google translator out because my Spanish was not very good then, to tell him, you know, I didn't, I wasn't speeding. Um, and so there is an emergency helpline that you can subscribe to here in Panama. I have one called Rodney Direct. It's about $90 a year, I believe. And anytime you get into a traffic situation, get a wreck, you know, have a flat tire, run out of gas, get pulled over by the cops and you can't communicate, you can call Rodney and they'll translate for you. They'll communicate for you. So I called Rodney and I said, I was not speeding. I don't know why in the world he's writing me a ticket. And uh, they pulled me over because they said I did an illegal U-turn. You can't do a U-turn on the Pan American Highway. When in fact, I didn't do a U-turn. I went all the way into the Price Mart parking lot, which is like a block away from the Pan American Highway. Then I got back on the Pan American Highway. But um, I got a ticket anyway. It was a $150 ticket for doing a U-turn on the Pan American Highway. So that's another thing you need to know. No U-turns on the Pan American Highway. Along the road, you'll see some signs that say Returno, R-E-T-U-R-N-O. And um, do you need to go to that return though, if you need to turn around and go back to, even if there's places where you could potentially do a U-turn on the Pan American Highway, don't do it. It's better to go to the next return home, which is not going to be very far away. And you can uh, turn around and go back the other direction if you need to. So it just started pouring down rain here right on time, five o'clock in the rainy season. That's when it starts raining here. Um, so hopefully I don't lose electricity, but if I do, for some reason, then you'll understand why. It seems just fine right now. It's just raining outside. So understand that whenever you're driving along, you need to pay attention to the signs. 
uh, what the speed limit is. And it could say 100 kilometers, and then it will say reduce your velocity, and it could go down to 80, it could go down to 60, it could go down to 40. After you get through that town that you're going to go through, then you'll see a sign that says resume your velocity, which will be back up to 100 kilometers. But it could just be five miles down the road, there's another sign that says reduce your velocity, um, and then you don't know what it's going to be reduced to until you actually see the sign. So you need to be watching for the speed limit signs. And usually it's a motorcycle um, cop that's going to be all along the Pan American Highway looking for people that are speeding. So the moral of the story is don't speed. Um, keep your eyes on the road for watching for the speed limit signs. And also keep your eye on the road for police officers. They're not going to go chasing you down. They're just going to say pull over. And if for some reason you didn't pull over, there's a motorcycle cop just a little bit down the road. And the cop that saw you speeding, he'll let the other guy know, hey, these people were speeding and they didn't pull over. The next guy will get you if the first one doesn't. So that's the important thing that you need to know. 100 kilometers is the maximum speed. So all you guys that are used to putting the pedal to the metal, you're not going to be able to do that here in Panama. Um, the other thing... Um, that you need to always have in your car if you get pulled over is they're going to want to see your driver's license. And if you don't have a Panama driver's license, you have to show your passport. Um, so always have your passport with you in the car and, of course, have your driver's license. They'll also want to see your insurance and they'll want to see your auto registration. Um, now, if you get a rental car, check that insurance policy to make sure that it hasn't expired. We've had some situations where people rented a car and not knowing that the insurance on it had expired. So make sure if you rent a car that you check the insurance and check your own insurance um, every once in a while because it's easy or put it in your uh, reminders on when your insurance expires so that you're not driving around with no insurance. If you are driving without your passport, if you're driving on a foreign license, um, but you already have a visa stamp in your passport, what will probably happen is they will impound your car. Um, they will make you get out of the car. You'll have to stand alongside the road. They'll call a wrecker to come and take your car away, and you'll get a ticket also. So then you have to make arrangements to get it out of impound, but if you don't have a Panama driver's license, um, you're not going to be able to drive it. So um, just follow the rules because um, they're real strict about uh, speeding. Now, you're going to see people speeding in the country. You can't say that, oh, well, nobody ever speeds because you're certainly going to see people that are speeding. But for you, you need to be paying attention to those speed signs and the police officers. Um, remember that we talked about in our previous live stream about getting a Panama driver's license. As a foreigner, you can drive in Panama with your foreign license as just a tourist for the first 90 days that you're in the country. After that, you can't drive anymore. Not at all. Uh, once you apply for a visa, they're going to put a stamp in your passport that says you've applied for a visa. Once that stamp goes in your passport, even before you have your visa card, you can no longer drive with your foreign license. So if you're only in Panama let's say for two weeks and you've just applied for your visa, it doesn't mean you can drive for 90 days on your foreign license. The minute you get that visa stamp in your passport or your visa card, you have to have a Panama driver's license to be able to continue driving. We previously did a video about getting your Panama driver's license and the two different ways that you can go about doing that. Um, the other thing about renting cars is many of the car companies, especially the national car companies, will not rent to you if you're 70 years or older. Um, there's no way you can rent a car from them if you're 70. So, but there's some of the local companies and some of the smaller, not national companies that you can still rent a car even if you're 70 years old. So before you pay online to rent a car, make sure you check their policy in Panama because some of the companies are not going to rent to you if you're 70 years or older. So you might be wondering, why is that? It's because in Panama, once you turn 70 to get your driver's license, you have to do some special um, psychiatric evaluations with either a geriatric doctor 
or an internal medicine doctor to see if you're mentally fit enough to be able to be driving on the roads in Panama. So many of the big national companies and even some of the local car rental companies will not rent to you if you're 70 years or older. So check that before you rent a car. Um, the other thing is if you go out to drink, if you go out to dinner with some friends or with your husband or wife or your partner, um, have a designated driver, one person that's not going to do any drinking. Because in Panama, you can be pulled over at any time for anything. There's checkpoints throughout the country, which I'll talk about later. And in Panama, there's not a certain amount of alcohol that you can have on your breath, and that's okay. If there's any alcohol, if you've been drinking at all, they can impound your car and give you a ticket. So there's no drinking and driving in Panama. So when you go out to eat, one of you can have the glass of wine at the restaurant. The other one's going to have to wait and have it whenever you get home. Now, of course, there are people that drink and drive and they take that risk and you can too. But just know if you get caught, um, they'll impound your car and you're going to get a ticket as well. So no drinking and driving. Um, also about the checkpoints. So throughout the country, there's checkpoints. And a checkpoint is where they might be checking for driver's licenses to see if they're current. They could be checking insurance uh, cards, uh, insurance paperwork to make sure your insurance is current. Um, they could just be checking to see if you're in the country illegally. Um, and if you are, they're going to deport you. So they're really strict about people being in the country that are not supposed to be in the country. So the checkpoint, it could be anywhere, especially on holidays where there's more people drinking. Uh, there's people that are checkpoints throughout the country and they may do a breathalyzer if they suspect that you've been drinking and driving. Also know that you can't talk on your cell phone uh, whenever you're driving. You need to pull over to use your cell phone and not, um, not talk on your cell phone whenever you're driving. So the checkpoints are something that are going to be throughout the country. And wherever you see a checkpoint today, it might not be there tomorrow. It might be further down the road someplace. So it could be anywhere along. Um, there's even places, especially around Pasacanoas, where you're close to the border of Costa Rica, where there can be one checkpoint. And then three miles down the road, there's another checkpoint. And then three miles down the road, there's another checkpoint. Um, so... You have to, those are some things that you can anticipate here in Panama that whenever you see the road is blocked off and they're checking driver's license, passport, insurance cards to see if you're drinking and driving, um, that may happen whenever you're driving. You may be lucky and um, drive all over Panama and never see a checkpoint, but that's very unlikely. You're probably going to see one while you're here. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about are the road conditions. So for the most part, along the Pan American Highway, the road is in very good condition. Once you get off the Pan American Highway, most of the roads are in very good condition. But on some of the auxiliary roads, they may not be in such good condition. There may be some, um, hear that big thunder out there? Uh, there may be some potholes in the road and things like that. But usually the main roads are in pretty good condition. There's usually two lanes and in good condition. The one thing you have to be really, really careful of is Panama, especially up here in the highlands where I live, we get about 150 inches of rain a year, 100, 150 inches of rain a year. So when it rains, it kind of seems like the Pacific Ocean just jumped down, just dumped right in front of you. And that makes it um, hazardous driving conditions. So I try to always be home. Before, I know in this time of year that the rains are usually going to start about four or five. So I try to always stay home by four or five so I don't get caught out in the rain because it can be raining so hard. It's very, very hard to see the road in front of you or other cars in front of you. Many people will put their flashers on their car just so that they're a little bit more visible. So I anticipate that that might happen. The thing you have to be really careful of if you're driving whenever it's raining is alongside either side of the road, there's some really deep ditches that are about three feet deep. And it could be completely full of water where you can't even tell that that's a ditch over there. So if you pull over to get away from the rain, be careful not to pull over into one of those ditches. Um, all the time, whenever it's raining, you see people 
uh, that have driven into a ditch. Um, maybe because they were driving too fast and they just slid into the ditch accidentally. And perhaps because um, they were trying to get off of the road and they didn't realize that there was a big ditch over there. So they ended up in it instead. Only way to get out of those is to have a, rucker, a wrecker that comes and helps you get out. They're so deep. Um, even if you have a four wheel drive, you're not going to be able to get out of it by yourself. Now, you know, I moved in April. I moved to a rental house in Alto Boquete. Uh, but I used to live on um, what's called Volcancito Road up really high in Poquete. And the road to get up to my house was a very windy road, deep, deep ditches on either side, but it's also a very narrow road. You're going to see that in some of the auxiliary roads that they're not very wide. They're very, very narrow. So that can make it a little bit scary when you're first driving on such a narrow road with sometimes some blind curves that you have to go around and you don't know if anybody's over there. So just be very, very aware of um, all the driving, all the different driving conditions here and go slow on a road that you're not familiar with. Even if it says you can go 80 kilometers, go 60 kilometers or even less than that. Um, there's, you don't have to go 80 just because it says 80, but um, you need to be careful especially if you're on a road that you're not familiar with. Auxiliary roads can be very, very narrow where you think there's no way two cars can fit down this road at exactly the same time, but they barely do. So I'm going to take your questions after I finish all of these comments. If you could hold off for your questions, um, then I'll take them in just a little bit. I want to get through all this information. Um, the other thing you have to be careful of and especially towns like in Panama City and also in David, and even in Boquete, um, we have this situation too, is some of the roads are one-way roads, and there's no sign that says it's a one-way road. You just kind of look down there, and you see that all the cars are parked in a certain direction, um, which might be facing you, so you shouldn't be driving down that road. So watch out for one-way roads, especially in David, um, in Boquete and in Panama City, in Santiago, in Chitre, um, you have to watch out for the one-way roads. And once again, if you're just going slow and you don't rush around, then you're going to be able to spot that one-way road and avoid it before you uh, drive down there. So I talked about that if you get pulled over, that you may just start writing a ticket. Um, the police officer may say that um, you'll you know, give me some money now and you won't get a ticket or they might just let you go. So I've had all those situations. I told you about my U-turn, which I didn't actually do on the Pan American Highway. There was another time that me and some of my girlfriends, we went to Bocas del Toro for a girls weekend out over in Bocas. And on the way back, we were driving back on a Sunday and it said 70 kilometers. We were going 70 kilometers and we pulled around a corner and all of a sudden, it was a school zone, which is like 40 kilometers in a school zone on a Sunday. And the police officer pulled me over because I was going 70 um, through a school zone on a Sunday. And he played that trick that um, he wanted to see my passport, my visa, you know, everything that I had, driver's license and auto registration, insurance. He wanted to see all of those things. And basically, he took all that stuff. He, he was in possession of that. I was not. And he told me that I could either pay $50 now or he was going to have to give me a ticket. And I'd have to come back to Bocas del Toro to pay that ticket. Well, I didn't have $50. I said, I don't have $50. We just spent all of our money in Bocas. And between us, uh, we were all able, able to gather up about $30. And I said, we've got $30 and that's all we can give you. And he said, well, I've got to go ask my supervisor if that's going to be okay. There was another cop that was standing not very far away. It wasn't a supervisor. It was just another cop. So they went and talked and decided that they could take our $30, and then I got all my stuff back. So I participated in a bribe. Yes, I did it because um, I didn't want to get a ticket, and I didn't want to have to go back to Bocas to pay it. The rules have changed now that you can pay a ticket online, but whenever that happened, which was like 2013, you had to go to the province where you got the ticket to pay the ticket. So people were much more likely to pay a bribe then um, than they were. Now, I would recommend that you not offer the bribe. 
you know, don't, if the police officer wants to, is just starting to write a ticket, it's pretty much too late at that point. You should not be the one that says, hey, can I give you, just give you $20 now and not get a ticket. Let them do the asking for that instead of you doing it because you never know if it's a setup that they could be um, setting you up and saying, well, they tried to bribe me um, and then they could haul you off to jail. So you surely don't want that to happen. So it's a situation you need to be careful of. If the police officer offers it, it's up to you if you decide to participate or not, but you should not be the one that's going to be offering it. So I've been here, what, 13 years. And in the 13 years, I've only had two times, and I do a lot of driving, I've only had two times that a police officer has pulled that, um, you know, give me the money now. Um, in December, I think it was in December, I was driving from Boquete to Avalle, and I got pulled over, and he showed me on the radar that I was going 80 in a 70-kilometer zone. And I didn't notice that it had, you know, I must have looked down or blinked for a minute, and I didn't notice that the speed limit had changed because usually I'm real good about that. Um, but he pulled me over, and he said um, that I could either give him $50 now or I could get a ticket, which would I prefer. And I said, well, I don't have $50, and I gave him 20 and he wrote me a receipt. He actually gave me a receipt for the $20 that I paid him, like that made it official or something. So things like this are going to happen, and I just want you to be prepared for it. And remember that if you are speeding or that they see you talking on their cell phone, they're not going to get on their little motorcycle and go chasing after you. They're just going to motion for you to pull over. And if they do motion for you to pull over, you need to do it because they've already taken a picture of your driver's license and they could um, they'll notify the cops down the road and eventually they're going to catch you. So just go ahead and give in and get pulled over. Um, some other things I wanted to talk about are parking and stop signs. So whenever you see stop signs, of course, you're supposed to stop, but not everybody stops at a stop sign. So you have to be extra, extra careful if you're coming up on a stop sign um, or if you're coming up on an intersection, because even if the other people have a stop sign, it doesn't mean they're going to stop. They might just keep on going. Even in, especially in uh, like downtown David, it's a really big problem because people just ignore the stop signs. It seems like in David or they barely stop and then they just keep on going and they're not really paying attention to look both ways. So when you come up on an intersection, be especially careful um, because the people, the other people driving, you might do the right thing, but the other people driving may go right through that stop sign. So you, that's where most accidents happen is at a stop sign. Um, and then I wanted to talk about um, parking. So, you know, part of driving is you're usually going from point A to point B, and when you get to point B, then you need to park. Like you're going to the grocery store, you're going to a restaurant, you're going... Um, shopping at a mall or something like that. So parking in many of the towns here is very limited. There's not a lot of parking. For example, I went to a restaurant today and they had seating for about 30 or 40 people at the restaurant and there's exactly three parking places in front. Um, and they're very narrow, very, very narrow parking places. After I finished at the restaurant, I went to Organica, which is like a miniature Whole Foods to get some Ezekiel bread and a couple of other things and uh, the parking places are super narrow so it's and I have a pretty big car so they're really really narrow and it can be um, you can be really close to the other people where they bang their car into your car so sometimes you're going to have to park a little bit further away and just walk to avoid parking in these super narrow parking places and avoid <laughs> Big thunder and avoid uh, people banging into you. So stop signs, I talked about that. Um, the other thing that you'll see at stop signs, yes, you're supposed to be stopped, but some of the things you'll see at a stop sign is if there, someone's wanting to get across the road and maybe there's no traffic going this way, but there's a lot of traffic going the other way. People will just pull out in the road and they'll block one side until they can get through to the other side. So we call that the push through. Um, and you'll you'll probably learn how to do that yourself because sometimes that's just about the only way you're going to be getting across the road is to just do a push through. So let me see if I've covered all the things on my list here. 
I'm going to open it up for your questions in just a little bit. And if you have a question, then you need to put three question marks in front of your question um, so that I can quickly and easily identify it as a question. Of course, here's another thunder. So when we say it rains here, it is pouring down rain. Like right now, I can't even see my neighbor's house. It's that, it's raining that hard, and then you can hear what the thunder's like. Hopefully, the electricity stays on, but we'll just keep on trying um, that hopefully it stays on. So someone had asked earlier if there's a service like AAA that you can call. So we don't have AAA in Panama. Of course, you can always call 911 here in Panama, um, if, especially if you have a Panama cell phone. If you have a foreign cell phone, a cell phone that you're using, you're going to have a hard time calling 911 using it. So, um, but if you have a wreck, if you run out of gas, if the police pull you over and you don't know what in the world they're saying and they're trying to take your car away from you, so what are you going to do? Um, we have several different services here in Panama and it's kind of a triple A and a 911 all rolled into one. I subscribe to one called Rodney Direct. Uh, there's also, and he covers all of Panama. There's also one in Coronado. I think it's called Coronado Hotline or Panama Hotline. That's what it's called. I have details about it in the online guide. But it's a it's an annual subscription. I pay ninety dollars a year, and they assign you a number. And then you go on their website and you fill out. You know, this is I am. This is who I am. These are my emergency contacts. If anything were to happen to me, these are directions to get to my house because many houses here do not have a address. Um, so you have to give directions on how to get to your house. Um, if you've got pets, you can list who your pet sitter is in case um, you can use them if you need to call an ambulance, the police, the fire department, if you have an automobile accident. Um, people have used them when they got locked out of their house and they needed a locksmith. So anytime you have some kind of emergency comes up, then that's who you can call. Um, I had an automobile accident a few years ago and I called them. You can check our website, PanamaRelocationTours.com for just write in the word accident and you can see the article, what to do if you have an automobile accident in Panama, which goes right along with driving in Panama with highly suggest that you read it. Can you guys hear that thunder? It's just rolling over here. Um, so um, let me get to um, some of the questions. Let me back up a little bit. So Monique says, do you have thunderstorms every day? So right now we're having thunderstorms just about every day, usually starting about four or five. Um, um, but yeah, we have thunderstorms every day. We have rain every day right now. Now, probably in July and August, um, it'll lessen up. We won't have as much rain, but then starting in September, October, November, we'll go back to having uh, thunderstorms and rain just about every day. The great thing about the rain are two things. One, it keeps everything lush and green and beautiful. The other thing, it keeps all of the lakes and reservoirs full and we use hydroelectric to generate electricity here. So that means that we have electricity, we have plenty of drinking water because we have so much rain. Um, but I do, you know, I, I especially just hate driving in the rain. It can just be dangerous and some people are going too fast and they get hydroplane on the road. That's when you see a lot of accidents uh, whenever it's raining. So, um, Wilfredo, what is the car insurance like? So it depends on if your car is more than 10 years old, you can only get liability insurance, which is going to be like $400 a year for liability insurance. By the way, all cars are required to have liability insurance. Um, if you have a newer car, then you can get full coverage. Um, I have a, my car is a 2020 Santa Fe. Hyundai Santa Fe, and my insurance for full coverage is $650 a year. So insurance is super affordable. Brian wants to know, are off-road vehicles or side-by-sides allowed on the roads? How about small scooters? Um, so all of those things are allowed on the road, but only if they have a license plate. Uh, they You can go you know, off-road without a license plate. But if you're going to be on a public road, they have to have a license plate. For them to get a license plate, you have to have an annual inspection. 
and we have all the information about how to get a car inspection. Very unique situation here in Panama for getting your cars inspected. Um, you'll also need a driver's license to be able to drive small scooter, off-road vehicles, or any of those things. Uh, Mike wants to know, how long does it take to get a driver's license? So to get a Panama driver's license, first of all, you can't get one until you have a visa in Panama. You have to have either your temporary visa or your permanent visa. But then once you get it, if you um, go the route of getting your license authenticated at the uh, embassy for your country and then re-authenticated at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, then the next day you can go and get your um, eye test and your hearing test and get your license. So it could take two or three days to get a driver's license. If you go the route of getting your driver's license by going to one of the driving schools, um, it could take a couple of weeks um, or two or three weeks or even a month for you to get your driver's license if you go that route. Uh, Victoria wants to know, is there disabled parking? Extremely rare to see disabled parking any or even handicapped parking or anything like that in Panama, at least, you know, in most places. Um, there's just not any parking, period, um, in a lot of places. And what limited parking, some are going to have an area that's painted blue that's for disabled, uh, via disabled people that have a disabled sticker in their car, but a lot of places don't even have that. I guess it's not required for all places to have a disabled parking space because it's not available everywhere. Uh, Penny wants to know, is it difficult to get auto insurance if you're over 70? Is, is it expensive? It's not difficult to get auto insurance if you're over 70. Um, the insurance is going to cost, they just go by not your age, but by the age of the car. So they just go by the car and the insurance goes with the car. So whoever's driving that car, um, the car has the insurance and whoever's driving it has the insurance that goes with the car. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit more difficult to get a driver's license if you're over 70, but not auto insurance. So Gail wants to know, is hands-free talking on your cell phone okay? Um, not according to the law. You're not supposed to be talking on the cell phone at all because that's distracting you, they say, from paying attention to the road and those um, speed limits and cops and other traffic and things like that. So you're not supposed to be on the phone at all when you're driving. If you get a phone call, best thing to do is pull over, take the phone call, finish it, and then get back on the road. And Rick wants to know, cost of buying a car in Panama compared to the U.S. prices. So I've bought four cars since I've been in Panama, four or five cars since I've been in Panama. And every single time I bought the car, I looked on like Kelly Blue Book to see what would that car cost in the U.S. compared to in Panama. The price is almost exactly the same, sometimes a little bit less in Panama. So it doesn't cost more. And Jeanette... By the way, if anybody has a question, you can put three question marks in front of your question and type it into the chat window, and I'll be taking questions for a little bit longer. If I use my old phone from Canada and buy a SIM card, can I get internet access for the month I'm in Panama? Um, yes, you can. Um, you, can get, um, you can get a SIM here for usually less than $5, and you can just pay for one month uh, for you to have service while you're here. Also check with your Canadian um, cell phone provider. They may have a special plan that you can use whenever you're traveling internationally, and that may be a better way to go. The other thing you should know about cell phones in Panama is everybody here uses WhatsApp. When you're talking to your attorney, they use WhatsApp. When you're going to call your doctor to make an appointment, they use WhatsApp. Um, whenever you're need your gardener to come over, your housekeeper to come over. You do everything with WhatsApp. So phone calls and making phone calls is not so popular here, but WhatsApp definitely is. Good question, Hayden. Does Panama have a point system for tickets affecting insurance? So Panama does have a point system for um, your, um, it's not going to affect your insurance, but what it's going to affect is you actually having a driver's license. Three tickets and you're out. Um, you're, you could lose your driver's license if you get three tickets. That's why 
a lot of people choose to pay the bribe instead of getting a ticket because if you get three tickets, you could lose your license. Um, even here in Pan and, and some of the towns have their own little rules. Um, here in Boquete, where I live, if you get two tickets for drinking and driving, you lose your license uh, for one year. Um, and if you get another one after that, then you lose your driver's license forever. So it doesn't so much affect the cost of your insurance, but could affect your ability to be able to drive at all. Janet wants to know, which doctors in Boquete authorize 70-year-olds to drive? Uh, name, please. So there is um, one of the doctors, her name is Dr. Boya, B-O-Y-A. Um, there's also... Mm, there's another doctor here, but I can't think of the name right now. It's called the Alpha A-L-F-A -A Clinic. It's in Alto Boquete, and they also authorize the over 70. Dave wants to know, hi, Jackie, can traffic parking tickets in Panama be a reason they deny you a permanent visa? So, yes, they can. So, it, it, it can be a reason for you to be denied getting a visa if you've had a lot of deed uh, drinking while intoxicated on your uh, criminal record. If you have that from another country and you want to get a license here, you could be denied getting a visa. If you have a lot of, what are they called, DWIs, DUIs. Um, but having them in Panama is not going to, they won't take your visa away once you get it. But if you get a lot of them, you could lose your license. Uh, wants to know, when you have your Panama permanent residency and driver's license, how long can you visit and drive in the U.S. or Canada on a Panamanian document? So I don't know what the rules are in Canada, but I do know in the United States that you can drive for 90 days. I'm assuming that it's the same in Panama because it's a um, reciprocity, because they let Canadians drive in Panama for 90 days with their Canadian license. They let U.S. citizens drive in Panama for 90 days with their U.S. license. So that's why it's 90 days in the U.S. and probably 90 days in Canada, too. So here's a question from Nick. Does public transportation allow pets? No, public transportation will not allow pets. Now, what you have, do see sometimes here in Panama is public transportation. If you have a dog, they won't let it inside the bus, but they'll tie it up on top of the bus. Um, I wouldn't be putting my, if I had a dog, I wouldn't be tying it on top of the bus, but that's what some people do. Um, how does the rain impact the relocation tours in the month of November, if at all? So it really doesn't affect our tours at all because um, the rain usually starts about four or five o'clock and we're at the hotel that we're going to go to by four or five o'clock. So today has been a beautiful day here. Blue skies, sh uh, sunshine, went out to lunch with Chuck and Debbie um, today to a new restaurant that has pretty good Mexican food. Um, so the whole day was a wonderful day, but then about four o'clock or five o'clock is when the rain starts. So the rain won't impact the tours. And Bobby wants to know, can you please go over again the Passover and pass through? I don't know what you mean by Passover and pass through. Okay, you're going to have to state the question another way because I'm not following you, Bobby. So Nick wants to know, are there street lights in those mountain roads towards the bigger towns? Some areas have street lights and a lot of areas do not have a street light. Um, so you want to make sure that the, the lights on your car work really, really well. Once again, um, it might just try to be home. I would say, unless you're real comfortable with driving in the rain, which I'm not trying to be home before the rain start about five o'clock, that's going to interfere with your evening entertainment of wanting to go, uh, to some bar that's having live music that doesn't even start until seven o'clock. It may happen though, that, by the time the band is finished playing at nine o'clock, the rains have already stopped. So whenever you're driving home, then you're not driving home in the rain. Me personally, I just try to be home by five and I stay home by five, four or five. When you have your Panama 
permanent residence and Panama driver's license. How long? Uh, we already did that question. Sorry about that. Let me try to find some other questions here. So Maria wants to know, once you get your Panama driver's license, do you automatically use your U.S. license? No, nope, you don't use your U.S. license at all uh, once you get your Panama driver's license. So you don't have to worry about that. Dave says, I did a phone interview with a doctor in Panama City using Zoom for my doctor approval. There you go. Yeah, you can do that. Um, there are some doctors that will do it. There's doctors throughout the country that you can go to um, to get your over 70 approval for getting your license. Okay, we've got another question here from Robin. Once a DL is obtained, how long until a renewal is needed if you turn 70 before the renewal? So this is the situation. In Panama, once you get your driver's license, before 70 years old, then it's good for four years. Um, and then you're going to have to renew it at the end of the four years. But if you're 70 years old, when you get your driver's license, then you have to renew your driver's license every two years. And every two years, um, you're not going to have to do the authentication at the embassy and all that stuff again. But you will, if you're 70 or older, have to go to the doctor, psychiatric evaluation, and do the vision test and hearing test every two years if you're 70 or older. By the way, whenever you turn 85 years old in Panama, not only are you going to have to do the psych psychiatric evaluation and the hearing test and the vision test, but they also make you do a driving test to see if you can do parallel parking, see if you can pull into a parking place and out um, without hitting the car next to you, and to see if you know how to use the brakes uh, well on the car. Um, so Jackie, can you comment on the supposed drought in Panama? Well, I've been reading about this drought in Panama, but I can tell you in Panama, we're getting plenty of rain. So um, whoever's writing those articles must not, not be living in Panama. Uh, Cal says, I've been watching PRT videos. And as I understand it, once I apply for my friendly nation visa and my passport is stamped, I cannot get my license for two years when I have my permanent visa. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. As soon as you get that stamp on your passport and you get your temporary um, visa card for your friendly nation visa, at that time, you can get your Panama driver's license. Now, when you get your permanent visa, you're going to have to renew your Panama driver's license when you get your permanent visa. Same thing. If you, um, let's say you got a pensionado visa where you get your temporary visa, then within six months, you're going to get your permanent visa. Uh, when you get your temporary visa, you can go ahead and get a Panama driver's license at that time. But whenever you get your permanent visa, within six months, you still have to renew your Panama driver's license because your driver's license is only good as long as your visa is good for. So if your temporary visa is good for six months, your driver's license is good for six months. If your temporary visa is good for two years with the friendly nation visa, then your driver's license is only good for two years. Um, so it has to be renewed when you get your permanent. But it's easy to do. The renewal part is super easy. Uh, it takes about 30 minutes. And you, all, you also get a discount. If you're jubilado age, uh, 55 for women and 60 for men, you get 10% off when you renew your driver's license. So I hope that answers your questions. Um, we have a lot more information about uh, driving in Panama, getting your driver's license, getting car insurance. We have recommendations in the online guide and you'll also get it during your Panama relocation tour on which insurance agents to use. The insurance agents we use um, have proven over and over again to give the best prices and really good service. Um, some insurance agents here, they bump up the price a little bit for expats and agents we work with, they don't play those games. Um, so I've got one more question I'm going to take here. Um, based on what you explain, is it undesirable idea to rent a car for a month while we plan to visit in December? So no, it's not. You could definitely rent a car for a month 
and places give a discount for renting for the whole month. I think the cheapest I've seen for a one month rental is about $800. So it's pretty expensive to rent a car. Um, but if you're going to be driving around the country, then you just need to follow um, this information that I've given you about, make sure you follow the speed limits, watch for those signs that say, reduce your velocity. And uh, you don't know what to reduce it to, but just slow down and definitely don't be talking on your cell phone whenever you're driving. So before you come here to Panama and you're ready to rent that car, you might want to review this live stream about driving in Panama just for refresher course before you actually start driving in Panama. So I hope you guys enjoyed our live stream about driving in Panama. Did anybody learn something new that you hadn't heard of before? Um, let us know in the comments um, if you learn something new or if you have any other questions, you can use the comment section to continue to ask questions and I'll answer them there. Thank you so much for joining me on this Saturday and next Saturday. Um, we have a guest named William that moved to Panama from Oaxaca, Mexico, and he's running this fabulous, I've seen videos of a fabulous two bedroom house, all new, um, fully furnished with a huge swimming pool for just $500 a month. So when you join me next Saturday, you'll learn where that is and how he found that rental. See you next Saturday, everybody. Goodbye.